Hello and welcome to the June edition of the Bloody Scotland Book Club. I am your host, Abir Mukherjee. I'm the author of the Wyndham and Banerjee series of novels set in Raj era India. Um, and today I'll be joined by three wonderful guests uh, and together we'll be re reviewing the brand new books by Christopher Brookmeyer, uh, Imran Mahmood, as well as a tribute to the Golden Age, uh, a classic begun by Dame Niall Marsh, but finished only 70 years later by Stella Duffy. Um, but this is a live and interactive book club and your participation is vital. So before I introduce my guests and the books, um, I want to thank you for joining the book club. Uh, thank you if you've maybe read some of the books already, um, but whether you have or you haven't, please do put your questions and comments in the chat function on your screen um, and I'll do my best to factor them into the discussion. Um, we'll go through each book one at a time and we'll also hear from each of the authors reading from their books. So on with the show. Um, tonight I am joined by an esteemed and wonderful panel. That's esteemed, not steamed. Um, <laughs> I've got Lee Randall. She's an editor, presenter, freelance writer, interviewer and festival programmer. And if you've been to a literary festival in Scotland, the chances are Lee played a role in organising it. Uh, I've got Alex Holly. Alex is a blogger and crime aficionado. He, crime fiction aficionado, I should say. You're not a crime aficionado, that's, um, or maybe you are. Um, he's been reviewing crime fiction for over five years and now has a weekly interview slot on the UK Crime Book Club. Uh, but we're not gonna talk about that, Alex. Um, and I also have Dr. Jackie Collins, who's a senior lecturer in film and TV at Northumbria University. And she's one not of the- Not anymore, few... darling, not you're anymore. Not. Okay, well, no. you're, you're, still, you're still very, freedom. very knowledgeable. Freedom, freedom. <laughs> are, you still, are you still involved with Newcastle Noir? Very much so. Ah, yeah. she's one of the organizers of Newcastle Noir. There you go, I should have done my homework, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, welcome to you all panelists. Uh, how are you all this evening? Right. Yeah, good. good. You ready for this? You enjoying you enjoying the football and the tennis that's been on? Sports are always a good thing, but books are what we're here for. Right? Books are what we're here for. Well said. Um, most importantly, have you all got a drink? Yes. Because this, this is a book club. You can't have a book club without some form of libation. What have you all got? What have you got, Alex? Um, just just my own fluids. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I won't dwell on that. Lee, what have you got? What are you drinking? Uh, red wine. Red wine. What kind? Oh, hang on. I've got the bottle here just in oh, case this goes on. Oh. It's kind. <laughs> what is that? Uh, I can't read it. It's um, nice. It's very nice. It's, it's lovely. Uh -huh. And Jackie, what have you got? Uh, uh, to remain slightly vodka. dignified, it's water. It's water. It's this vodka. Otherwise, uh, it could get very messy. <laughs> I've got I've got a whiskey. Uh, this is a Glen Glen Morangy tonight. Um, we'll start with that, and then we'll see where we get to. Yeah. Um, now that we've got the important things out of the way, um, let's move on to our first book, which is The Cut by Christopher Brookmeyer. Um, let me tell you a wee bit about it. Millie Spark is a special effects makeup artist whose talent is to create realistic scenes of bloody violence. Then one day she wakes up to find her lover dead in her bed. Uh, 25 years later, her sentence for murder served. Millicent is ready to give up on her broken life uh, until she meets troubled film student uh, and reluctant petty thief, Jerry. Together they begin to discover that all was not as it seemed on that fateful night and someone doesn't want them to find out the truth. Um, before we get to it, let's hear from the author himself. This is Christopher Brookmeyer reading from The Cut. Millicent inched forward in the queue, relieved to find herself in a situation that made sense, waiting in line. This was going to be the easiest part of her morning's quest. All she had to do was order coffee and cake. Then the child behind the counter asked what she wanted. As she opened her mouth to speak, she caught sight of the boards on display behind the counter. Five columns of options, not one of them, simply coffee. It wasn't merely that she hadn't heard of half of them, there were just too many. She was paralysed. She felt a tap on her shoulder. You're next, said a slight man accompanied by a large dog. Millicent's mouth remained open, but she still didn't know what to say. Is it a latte, maybe? A cappuccino? asked the girl. Then, 
Do you need a wee minute? Her voice suddenly cloying, talking like Millicent was a child. The little man with the big dog tutted and sighed. Millicent's instinct told her just to leave, as she needed her proof for Vivian. Maybe I can serve this gentleman while you're deciding, the girl suggested. That would probably have been okay, but the problem was, he made a move. He didn't wait for her assent, he simply stepped across her. I just want a flat white to go, he said, speaking like she wasn't there. She had to stand her ground. Millicent threw an arm up to block his path, turning to confront him. Where do you think you're going? I'm in a bit of a hurry, he explained. Allow me to explain to you the concept of hierarchy, she replied. At its most basic, it derives from who was here first, and we call this a cue. It's just to give you a wee minute to help make up your mind, the girl offered. No, he can wait his turn like he's supposed to and not act like I don't exist. There's no need for that attitude, the man said. And there's no need for you hassling me either. How urgent is this coffee you're needing? Is it defibrillator coffee? And what are you doing my dog twice the size of you? How does that work? Do you hump its leg? At that point, she felt another hand on her shoulder. This time, it was another member of staff, a woman wearing a stern expression. I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to leave. We don't tolerate this kind of antisocial conduct towards our customers or our staff. Millicent felt, for, Millicent felt the shop melt around her. I need to get my card stamped, she said feebly, her voice failing. If you don't leave, I'll have no, set, no hesitation in calling the police. It's company policy to prosecute. At the very mention of the police, she felt the blood drain from her face, a familiar hollow forming in her gut. She knew the consequences. She shuffled towards the door, the manager opening it for her. And never mind stamped, your card's marked, the woman told her, don't come back. Well, there we have it. Um, what an opening. Um, can I just say, before we start going into this book, does anybody recognise the background there for where Chris was filming from? I think, and somebody might correct me if I'm wrong, that looked like the couple of the um, the Mitchell Library in Glasgow. Um, but it's not, not a lot of people know this, but superstar Chris Brookmeyer um, has a replica of the Mitchell Library in his <laughs> garage. Uh, that's how he rolled. So it's actually his house. <laughs> just looks like the Mitchell Library. Um, mm. Bob is telling me that he thought it was the Mitchell Library, but it's not. It's it's superstar yeah. Chris Brookmeyer's house. And, um, and not, even, not even one of those screens. It, oh, no, I it's mean, real. It's real. <laughs> yeah, amazing. It's scale slightly different. I think it's one to two. His is a bit bigger than the actual thing, but um, <laughs> that's what it is. Now, who would like to kick off the discussion? Who is going to champion this book? I, I um, will. Can, okay, Lee, you kick off for us. I will. And in, I'm glad we're all laughing because... My view on this is that the cut is the paella of crime novels. It's got so many different ingredients that shouldn't necessarily taste good together. And it's delightful. So as you can, you've all heard the thing, Chris is always reliably funny, clever, and angry. And these are qualities I adore about Chris. Um, and as I say, so some of the ingredients in this book, we've got, um, really repulsive baddies and really good goodies. We've got um, sexism, sexual abuse in the film industry. We have undercover cops pretending to be in relationships with people to further their own agendas. We have racism. We have this uh, sense of entitlement, both hearkening back to the issue of um, the film industry and with the young film student in university and who, who's in the hierarchy at the university. We've also got um, something else which I really, oh, we've got this weird trend, this new trend of getting young people to live with older people as a sort of social experiment, which is really interesting. And then we also have genre snobbery, which um, in this book is about horror films, but uh, you know, I've read Chris's books before. He's not just talking about one genre, he's talking about all people who condemn other people's preferences for culture and art, including people who sneer at crime fiction, boo hiss to them. I've got, um, I, I also think, I've got loads more to say. I've got, I think that we can draw a thread between this and Imran's book later, because that's about a homeless man and what that's done to him. And in this book, we learn about how Millicent's been affected by incarceration. Mentally, she's still uh, institutionalized. Um, and she's, she knows some things about the 21st century, but not all things, and she's very suspicious of stuff. 
Um, and then again, I can't believe that was the clip he read because the thing I love about this book is it's not, I hate books where old people are supposed to be cute, where they climb out of a window and they walk across the lawn and they fart and they curse. And we're supposed to think, oh, isn't that cute? An old person did something. Old people were doing stuff before we were born, mm -hmm. right? Old people invented stuff. And the people in this book are not mocked. And there's a group of older women, there's loads of older people and they're not treated like cutesy, whimsical um, entertainment things. Did right, I right to the end. I mean, the last paragraph oh. of the book, <laughs> it's, it, it's made to any um, of exactly. those ideas. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there anything I didn't like? There were one or two coincidences that I thought strained my credulity. But by that point, I was so invested in the whole story that I was like, okay, I'll go with that. That'll, <laughs> that'll work for me. The paella of crime novels. I have not heard of higher praise. He will never um, forgive me for that. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. Who would like to come in on, on the paella of crime novels? Well, I was likely to say that I didn't find any fishy bits. So, <laughs> <clears throat> um, as I was listening to it on audio and it had two separate narrators, I thought that it was really well done because of the two different generations it covered um, and it needed the two narrators for that I think because if it had just been the one it wouldn't have worked. Um, when when you're talking about Chris's work comedy is essential um, but the time um, lags uh, when you went back into the past um, because they started as new, new chapters were okay but in other books, um, authors sometimes do that in the middle of a chapter, and you're a bit you're a bit struggling on audio because there's no obvious page marks. Um, but in this, because you started it with new chapters, it worked. Um, as you went through the book and discovered why everything was happening from both angles, uh, you could see that Chris had cut tried to cover um, all the book in a lot of, a lot of layers. And uh, the film reference competition was very funny because I thought, am I going to work this out before the character does or not? I enjoyed that bit. And did you? Uh, on a lot of them, no, because I wasn't old enough for a lot of the references. But uh -huh. given that Millicent is in the 70s, I'm not surprised by that. Well, that's right. There are games within games in this. Um, Jackie yeah. Graham's written to ask, is there a risotto of crime fiction? Um, we are. We, I think there should, there's a whole, there should be, there should be a whole range of rice related books uh, to do with crime fiction. I would like to hold my hand up as writing in India. Um, at least one of those should be mine. Um, Sue Munro says, it's a very clever book, refreshing to read about someone coming back into the world after being locked away uh, to see how they cope and how with a changed world. She hopes, she says, I hope I'm as energetic as Millicent when I'm in my 70s. Um, yeah, especially that last paragraph, I have to say. Jackie, what, what did you think of the book? Yeah, I, I really enjoy um, seeing that notion. I think Lee, you know, talked about it, but that, that sense of agency that even, you know, you know, I mean, this woman has been locked away, has grown older, and yet it's not over. I love that sense of, you know, it's like I, I may be at a certain age, but it ain't over yet. I'm still not done. And then, you know, to take another outsider, shall we say, you know, because it's always, you know, a, a story in tandem is always beautiful. And the way you see people start to bond and what brings people together and finding that commonality and then that purpose. And with Jerry, it's like, would would this happen? Would this really happen? Does it matter? It's like, you know, I think Chris, you know, again, Chris, Chris takes you on, on, a, on a journey that says, put these things to one side. It's okay if, if it might not happen, just go with me and see what I can do with this. And, and he works some incredible you, magic. You're right. You're right. I think, I think um, you know, a writer has to earn that suspension of disbelief. Um, mm. and, and Chris's writing gives him that, you know, he, he earns it. He earns mm -hmm. our, our respect because we want to go with them. 
don't we? Yeah, and I, I think there's a, sh you know, with the humour and, and with the writing, you know, but there's a, a sharpness, you know, it, it, it's like, I, I was thinking, you know, you mentioned paella, and it's like, and, and so the, you know, the chopping things, the ingredients, and, and he's got a way of just slicing through things. Um, the cook, I mean, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I also, again, with the film thing and the reference to Jallo, um, and, and for me, I, I have very fond memories of a, somebody giving a paper where they mentioned two films and one's Don't Torture a Duckling and The House of Laughing Windows. And to see, you know, somebody bringing in Jallo and it's like, yes. So, yeah, I, I was very excited by the book. It was a bit embarrassing, the excitement level, yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you my two cents on it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big Chris Brookmeyer fan. Um, you know, I've, I've seen his library, so uh, I would be. Um, I love this book. I love, I, I love the way, as, you, as you've all said, he takes you on a journey. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a journey towards something that I've never, no, where I've never been before. You know, this, this, the, the industry, the crime fiction industry. Um, you know, I, in, a, in a previous life, in, in my days when I used to do finance, you know, I did a few film financing deals. So I know that everything he's written checks out. He's researched this. And not only has he researched the genre, which I think is something that he loves, but he's, he's researched the industry. Um, and what he's written rings true. And it kept me in that bubble. We were talking about that. So, I mean, as you say, it's everything. It's the story. It's the it's it's this going down a rabbit hole into a world you would never go into. You know, yeah. you never. I never thought I would enjoy a book about horror films, mm -hmm. but it was great. Right. Yeah. yeah. But this is not hagiography. We're not here just to tell the authors how brilliant they are. Has anybody, is there anything that you maybe didn't like or or would um, would, 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 would wanted to see done differently? Well, considering that it went through um, a number of countries in the book, it didn't really go into the details about different films from those countries. It could have, it could have been a bit more sarcastic with the film references from other countries a bit, mm -hmm. I think. Anybody else? Any other comments? There are a couple of big coincidences. No, 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 no. I'm just being vague. And um, certainly one coincidence I found, you know, I thought, oh, well, I, I could, I figured out it was coming. And I was like, this is a bit pat, but I'm going to go with it because I, I'm in love with these characters now. I also was intrigued by the fact that um, a woman with a passport, as, as we've been saying, this is not a spoiler, goes to other countries. But Chris um, made it possible because he had built into the character her the fact she's a makeup artist. And who else can use a birthmark to such beautiful effect but Chris yeah. Bookmeyer? Yeah. I was like, yes, <laughs> you know, okay. I was I was I was resisting that moment in the book, but okay, you convinced me. I think I think you're right. It's it, there's so much going on that we do give Chris the benefit because we, it, it's it's a wonderful book. And and um, I wonder as well, do we not? I mean, I know I do it. You maybe don't. You may be very sensible, pragmatic people. Yeah, but we look I often, it, don't we? Don't yeah, we? <laughs> yeah, but I I often do that. You know, look look for those chance links with people or situations or and and and. You know, and would they, you know, can we account for them in any rational way? Maybe not. So, you know, I, I could even go with some of those coincidences because sometimes they happen in life. I mean, Ooh. yeah. Well, Chris did work in the industry in the past, so it's not just research. Was oh, that right? Oh, well, that explains. Yeah. I should yeah. also say, um, I'm being told that him, Chris has been longlisted for the McIlvany Prize this year. He's the only writer to have been longlisted every year. Uh, although at least once that was as Ambrose Parry, which was basically his wife's work. Uh, so I think that's cheating. Uh, <laughs> but there you are. Yeah, yeah. Can I say that? He's not listening. He'll be all right. And um, I was one of the judges the year he won it. Oh, so it's your fault. <laughs> Okay, I'm right. just saying because I've never, I've never um, been shortlisted for the McIlvany Prize, Lee. I'm just telling you that. Um, just, I'm not, I'm not saying anything else. I'm just saying I haven't, and, and we'll leave it there. Um, I think we should move swiftly on. So, oh, before we do, what do we think? So, thumbs up for that or thumbs down? Oh, up, thumbs up. Yeah. 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 
Okay, so we have eight thumbs up. Do you remember that old advert for PG Tips with the two thumbs fresh? Or maybe I just made that up. It's quite racist, actually, but anyway. The Indian guy going, two thumbs fresh. <laughs> That's what it was like. I think we should move on now. Let's move on to our next book. Um, we have next up, um, I Know What I Saw by barrister turned novelist Imran Mahmood. Imran is a practicing barrister with almost 30 years of experience fighting cases. And when you see him, you probably think it's about 40. He looks a bit older than that. Um, he hails from Liverpool, but now he lives in London with his wife and daughters. His debut novel, You Don't Know Me, was chosen by Simon Mayo as a BBC, Two, BBC Radio 2 book club choice um, for 2017 and was long listed for the Thixton's All Peculiar Crime Novel of the Year and the CWA Gold Dagger. More importantly, it is being adapted for TV and we should see it on our screen soon. But we are here to talk about his new book, I Know What I Saw. Um, it's the story of Xander Shoot, a once wealthy banker, now living on the streets uh, of uh, his shelters for the night in an empty Mayfair flat. Uh, when he hears the occupants returning home, he scrambles to hide. Trapped in his hiding place, he hears the couple argue and soon finds himself witnessing a vicious murder. Uh, but who was the dead woman? Who the police later tell him couldn't have been there? Uh, and why is the man Xander saw with her? evading justice. As Xander searches for answers, his memory of the crime comes under scrutiny, forcing him to con confront long buried past and the stories he's told about himself. Uh, how much is he willing to risk to understand the brutal truth? Um, before we get into it, let's hear Imran reading from the book. Chapter one, Tuesday. The sky is a bruised sea. It threatens to burst and split the night. There is a children's play park nearby. The gates are shut but unlocked and they push open easily with a gentle squeak. Of course, at this time of night, it's deserted and I know that I can sleep here until light. Time, as it ticks on a watch, is not as useful to me as how the light looks when it waxes or wanes. For me, the time is hidden in shadows and in the lengths they cast on the ground. I think about earlier today, about Amit and the fruit now warm in my pockets, that at 17 years old he thinks about me at all is a surprise. I've known him a summer and an autumn, and now most of a winter, and he brings me oranges, when most people bring nothing but chaos and dirt. The ground here is covered in wood chips, making a decent mattress under the slide, where it is dry, shaded from the elements by the wide tin slope. Before, when I knew too much about numbers and nothing about living, I tried to sleep in the tunnel to use its seclusion, but the curve is death to sleep. Now I crouch under the slide and tear out sheets of newspaper, rolling them into apple-sized balls. I can't read the financial pages anymore. So the pink ones are the first to go. Each one is forced into the gaps in my coat sleeves, the wool inflating until I'm like the Hulk. And then I do the same to my, the legs of my jeans. In no time air is trapped in pockets and my body warms. The paper clings on to the heat. The remaining balls I arrange into the carrier bag from Amit's oranges and convert into a pillow. I lay the oranges by my head because the scent of them comforts me. From here, all I can see in the blue moonlight is the dulled metal underside of the slide. The position of it sloping up towards me, upside down, gives me a sensation of vertigo. Vertigo. Mum wrote a paper about vertigo, the film, and Proust, and how much the one had borrowed from the other. Madeleine Elster was Hitchcock's heroine's name. The connection was obvious, Mum said. Proust's Madeleines and his painter Elstir combined into one. And then wasn't vertigo just a yearning for lost time? Wasn't it the yawning abyss that caused the vertigo? Mum was an academic above everything else, the kind of person who could only escape the gravity of life by manipulating herself with art. Rothko was her thing. I hadn't really ever got on with, with the abstractness of him. It didn't make sense to me having a painting of just four colours. 
But isn't that just the incredible thing about him, Zander? That a person using four colours and no representational effort can paint oblivion. Don't you find that amazing? She was the kind of person who looked up to rarefied heights, but down was where I wanted to be, with my nose in the dirt and the physics. Who would like to lead off on this one? Well, I shall advocate for it, I think. Ah, go on then. Champion this book, Alex. Uh, as a former law student, I've, I've, oh, I've liked both of it in Rand's books. This one is less court, court based uh, than his first book. Um, as the is his first book involved uh, the closing mm -hmm. statement. Um, this this book um, had a legal basis from the point of view on duty to solicitor. Um, so it's completely um, different in tone, I would say. Although although you do get to have a lot to do with flashbacks. Like he, like he used in the first book. Um, flashbacks are an essential part of the story as, as they allow for the um, arc of the story to be told and the emotions behind it to, to, be, to come, come, come alive. I must admit, it was a difficult book for me to review because it reflected what was going on in my own life at the time, which is not great, but... As uh, as we know, um, often the way that you see a book is what what happens at the time. It's never in a vacuum. So this book sort of it's it touched you in a way because of what was going on and it resonated. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And it's and it, it, sorry, dealt with, dealt with the emotions very well. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, as you say, this this is a book which, which you know has time shifts. We talked about different time shifts in the last book. Yeah. Uh, this is one that does it extremely well as well. Um, we are seeing a man who is has you know broken down in many ways. Uh, 30, he's had a, a breakdown over thirty years, and and we're seeing what he was like before that, and what he's like now, and what's led up to it, and it's it's handled very very well. Um, why don't I come to you, Jackie? What did what did you think of the book? Um, I, I I was fortunate enough to to pr prepare the book uh, alongside Trevor Wood's latest book, mm -hmm. so so the whole notion of of, of the voice the, of the homeless person, um, and you know, and, and, and you know, I'm sure you know we've said that, you know that idea of voices that we either don't hear or we don't want to hear, um, and you know like, like Alex was saying this this wasn't necessarily an easy read. But then, you know, why should everything that we read just make us feel comfortable? I think it's it's good to be challenged. So on, on that sense, because it was like, this could be any one of us whose lives are in a comfortable position and, and you know, a twist of fate and, and that that is gone, you know, and, and how then do we deal with that? So, so that was a little bit tricky. And then, um, Again, you know, I, I have problems with an unreliable narrator. And, and I don't know whether it's because, you know, it's like, please just tell me the truth. You know, maybe I'm a simple, I'm a simple girl and I, I just like to have something that I can hold on to because then when I hold on to it and it's actually, ah, but wait, ah, but wait. And then that is the skill of the author though, isn't it? To be able to say to you, really? You know, I, I think maybe I'm just gullible. And and you know to be taken. Well, I mean, do we live? Do we live in a world of truth? I mean, I look at our politicians. Oh, um, yeah. You know, our prime minister refused to sack somebody and then took credit for it within twenty four hours. I mean, what, yeah. what what is truth? Ex ex exactly, exactly. And so, even as uncomfortable as it might be, mm -hmm. to to have a book that says to you, really, honestly, is is either do you really believe this, or or an author that pulls you one way and pulls you another over their character you know that, that's that's class writing yeah it is. lee what are your thoughts on the book i agree with a lot of what's been said um i thought although i've never been homeless and i don't know the experience i nevertheless felt it resonated truthfully i felt that he managed to convey both the way <clears throat> that a homeless person has to make 
a thousand calculations mm -hmm. at every moment. Is this place safe? Is that safe? Where can I go? What can I do? What's, what's going to be okay? But is also, he, he talked about the way that prolonged homelessness had had a deleterious effect on the man's cognitive abilities, mm -hmm. not just his mental health, but his actual cognitive abilities. And I thought, yes, that feels true as well, even though there's all this thinking going on. Um, and I know, because I, I read some interviews, I know that his goal was to explode our ideas about what gives a person value. And that was fine. I had nevertheless had some issues with the book. I was totally engrossed. I was propelled into the book. I was there. And then the ending. And I have no intention of spoiling the ending for anyone. But I had an issue with the morality of the ending, not just discovering what had been done by whom, but the attitude around that mm -hmm. still, still is not sitting well with me. And there's, a, there's an, an item of evidence whose discovery after 30 years, I find I, my credulity cannot go there with the writer. I, <clears throat> I, I was like, really? You were able, this was, this thing was able to be found still then in that place, in that, and I just, I'm not, I can't sit well with that. So though I nevertheless thoroughly enjoyed the book 90% of the way, but in hindsight, the book's making me a little bit uncomfortable. That's not a bad, as Jackie said, that's not a bad thing. I, I understand that. And I would say that, you know, a lot of times it's the writer's job to make us feel uncomfortable. For me, a good book is one that entertains, but also makes me think and, and reassess. Um, I, I understand what you say. I should point out um, that Imran and I are our friends, full disclosure. Um, it really pains me to say this because I wanted this book to be terrible. Right, I wanted it to yeah, be so bad yeah. I could commiserate with them. Unfortunately, and this is my honest opinion, this is this book is wonderful. It's brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, it's to me, it's a book that comes along every decade. Um, I think it's written sublimely. I think um, the language, the metaphors, the imagery, all works uh, on a level that I think is is up there with Denise Minor. And you know, in my book, that's that's the highest praise I can give. Unfortunately, curse you, Mahmoud. Um, I, I I love this, but I understand what you're saying. I understand the issue with this piece of evidence. I I understand your issues with the ending. Um, but we're giving, you know, we 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 talked about this with um, with Christopher Brookmeyer's book about giving an author the the benefit of that of having taken us on that journey. For me, you know, I was taken on such, I was transported on such a journey um, that I I was willing to to accept that because I understand what was being done with it. Um, I, I take your point, but I, I gleaned personally so much from this book um, that it, it's, it's gonna make my list of the best books of this year, probably the best books of the decade for me. And it really hurts me to say that because I can just see his smug face right now. <laughs> Okay, and, and it hurts. Uh, let's have some comments. We've got Gil Porter saying, uh, I know what I saw, so stole two days of my life, all in a good cause. I think you deserve some money for that. I have Imran's bank details, Gil. If you let me, I'll send you the details. Just tell me how much money you want for those two days. Um, Linda Hill says, I know what I saw. Sounds fabulous to me on my TBR list and just bumped right up. Um, no, no, put it down a bit, put it down a bit. Um, no, exactly. <laughs> Imran is apparently on this thread now. He has uh -huh. watch it. He's changing his bank details. Uh, so yeah, oh, <laughs> it's just as well I said nice things about him. <laughs> It's coming for me now. <laughs> no, 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 no. We've all, we. I think, you know what? We have to be honest. Um, and... I'll be here. I'll be here. Can, can I, something, something just, just on this book that uh -huh. I meant to say and, and didn't. Uh, well, now you know he's on the, the thread. Now, now yeah, you, yeah. You Jack but, okay, is coming please, back. Please, please don't hate me, Imran. No, but, but other people have said it as well. And, and again, maybe it's, it's for us, the reader, to think about this. Um, and I know other people have commented on this, but it's the fact of this man's background you know, what if he hadn't had the illustrious past that he had? You know, what if Imran had, had written him as somebody who'd had no 
you know, potential future. I mean, how would how would we feel about a homeless person who'd never had a job, never had a home, never had a relationship? You know, mm. would we have? I don't know. Would we have gone near this book? Or even, yeah. Well, that's a really good question, Jack. Would such a book have been, you know, sanctioned by an editor or a publisher? Um, because at the end of the day, I mean, speaking from experience, I might want to write a character a certain way, um, and and I may get pushback from an editor saying, "Well, this character is thoroughly unlikable," and I say, "It's based on me," and they say, "Yes." Um, yes I don't know. <laughs> but you have you have that problem. You have the the problem of the the character that we're going to spend three hundred, four hundred pages with has to be relatable in a way. Otherwise, we won't do it. As as Alex said, we've all got other things to do so other books to read you know and and so it's a tough one it, if, if I think with this book as well um the education of the central character plays such a role in um in in the the you know the story you know to make the story what it is his background his vocabulary you know mm -hmm. I think he's quoting Proust at certain points, yeah, okay, it's just they're not yeah. showing off, but it's also you know the character, um, and all of that gels together, and and it for me it added to the the warmth of the book, or mm. it, it added to the experience. But your question, Jackie, I don't have an answer for. Um, Lee, I, Alex, and, yet, and yet it's interesting, is it not, that the the police, you know, despite this man's privileged background, mm -hmm. he is a homeless person and not to be believed and not you know and not to be listened to so you know the labels that we place on people well Trevor think... Woods and Sarah Heatherly's books also cover it at the same same issue with different angles and I think that homelessness is going to be an area which is going to be covered by lots of people and we're going to see the different ends of it as a different end of the scale and as Jackie says at the moment we're not seeing we're not seeing um, homelessness people in the way that we would. Yeah, we're not seeing we're not seeing them in a way that the society paints them in in the media. So, mm -hmm. Lee, well, yeah. I I noted down a quote because he says he really does engage us with exactly this issue, and at one point um, he borrows a suit because he has to go someplace where this. And he says. In this new disguise, in Seb's suit, I discover a thing. People smile at me. Mm -hmm. Imagine 30 years on the streets without, you know, without that. Mm -hmm. And you change your, you take a bath and you change your clothes and suddenly people give you an automatic buy. And they don't yeah. judge you the same. I, people judge each other all the time, but they don't judge you the same way. And they actually even see you. You're not invisible anymore. And I mean, I, so as I say, all those points I thought were really well. I mean, your points, your points about the ending are valid. Um, you know, and it's it's worth pointing out. As as we said, you know, we're not here just to to cheer to the rafters. Um, uh, Linda Hill says we need books about humanity, mm -hmm. regardless of the characters' backgrounds. It's part of the power of books and reading, and I think that that's absolutely right. We, we are trying to expand our horizons when we read. Um, so before we continue, thumbs up or thumbs down? Two thumbs fresh, one thumb fresh. Come on, one and a half, two. I oh, we're, two. It's, yeah. a, it's a plus. It's we're, we're doing well with that. Um, as I say, before we continue, though, I do have a bit of an issue. Uh, it's a bit of a bugbear of mine, uh, and I think it's come up in recent days because I've been talking to a couple of uh, authors who've just had their books out, uh, and we're living in difficult times. We're living in COVID times. Um, People are finding it very difficult to get, if you're not an A-list writer, like, mm. I don't mean A-list in terms of your writing, but if you're not selling bucket loads, um, people are finding it very difficult to get their books into uh, being stocked by mm. bookshops, supermarkets, etc. cetera. Um, and this goes back to what we are talking about, which is how do we broaden our horizons if we're still given, you know, the same limited window because you know I've been I've been singing the praises of this book and uh, but a lot of people will find it difficult to get their hands on it because they can't find it in a local bookstore um and you know what do we do about that what how I mean if I go into my local uh Saints no choose my local Asda right in 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 Surrey I know that the books that I'll see on stock there will be the same as the ones on the Isle of Dogs where I used to live 
and they'll be the same in the Isle of Harris, you know, in the Outer Hebrides or wherever. Why do we have such a narrow range of books which are being sold? Why is it so I, difficult? It's it's really tricky and, you know, not wishing to take away from any of those A-listers, you know, yeah. who are dear authors and, and dear friends and things like that. But knowing that crime readers in particular, you know, have a voracious appetite and, and whilst, you know, we might like our comfortable read where we know where we're going because we know that author, we also enjoy a challenge. We, you know, we, we like to be taken to the edge of, yeah. mm, this is different. And, and I know the market drives so much, but, you know, I, I, that's why I think, I think you know, mm. programmes, recordings, things like this are just so important. To, to, you know, to, to enable readers to think, oh, maybe I will go and order that. I will ask for that. I think, Lee, you made a point about the sort of books that people are reading. You know, certain books are, are just like a hug uh, for, <laughs> that people need at these times, but other books do challenge us. Mm -hmm. How do we get that balance? How do we get the challenge? How do we get people to step up to the challenge if they can't find the books? I think it's very difficult. Something happened in publishing a few years ago a few years ago, I mean, I'm talking probably over a decade ago, I used to work in publishing in the 80s and it was a very, very different world. It was also a different country, so there's that. But at, at some point, it stopped being, um, in my perspective, at some point it stopped being the editors who were driving the car and the marketing departments mm -hmm. started driving the car. And I have heard writers say that, you know, and agents say, you know, if the marketing department, the editor likes a book and brings it into the meeting, says, I'd like to buy this book. And if the marketing department says, I can't put that in Tesco's, boom, they reject the book. Yeah. Now, I know every year there's a surprise hit and there are quirky things and there are always people, there are small indie presses that are fighting the good fight and, you know, yay. But, but for the big company, well, it's, it's like one big company. <laughs> It's, it's the driver has changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's up to people like us, as Jackie said, to remind people that other vehicles are available. I'm fine. Other vehicles are available. Other recipes as well as paella are on the menu. I'm finding audio books a real problem. Like, yeah. for example, because um, a couple of the nominations for this year's McElvenny Prize are from small indies, they're not on audio yet. And that, that, that impacts you because you do most of your reading. Um, yeah, most of your research on five of the current long-listed McIlvenny aren't on audio yet. Mm -hmm. which is, I mean, these are issues that need to be dealt yeah. with. Um, okay, we should move on. Before we do, yeah. how are you all getting on with your drinks? Still, do, Lee, yeah. come on, top up. Yeah, come on, Lee. Come on. <laughs> but you, all of you at home, come on, top up your drinks. We're going to move on now. Um, let's move on. Finally, we have... Last but not least, uh, Money in the Morgue, uh, an Inspector Allen mystery started by Dame Niall Marsh during the Second World War, um, but she never finished it. And 70 years later, Stella Duffy took up the cause. Um, the book was shortlisted for the CWA Historical Dagger in 2018. Uh, and here's what it says on the back. It's business as usual for Mr. Glossop as he does his regular rounds delivering wages to the government buildings scattered across New Zealand's lonely Canterbury Plains. Uh, but when his car breaks down, he's stranded for the night at the isolated Mount Seeger Hospital with the telephone lines down, a storm on its way and the nearby river about to burst its banks. We all know what's coming. Trapped with him at Mount Seeger are a group of quarantined soldiers with a serious case of cabin fever. Three young employees embroiled in a tense love triangle, a dying elderly man, an elusive patient whose origins remain a mystery, and a potential killer. When the payroll disappears from a locked safe and the hospital's death toll starts to rise faster than a COVID epidemic, it doesn't say that, um, <laughs> and the appearance of an English detective working in counter espionage be just a lucky coincidence or is something more sinister afoot? Now, before we continue, let us hear, let's actually hear a wonderful interview from Stella Duffy. Hello, Bloody Scotland Book Club. I'm Stella Duffy and this is Money in the Morgue by Dame Naomi Marsh and me, not a dame. Um, 
I'm just going to read you a bit from chapter one and you can decide who wrote it, her or me, or is it just line by line? Who knows? I know. Um, Harper Collins know. You can ask me, I'll tell you. Chapter one. At about eight o'clock on a disarmingly still midsummer evening, Mr. Glossop telephoned from the transport office at Mount Seeger Hospital to his headquarters, 20 miles away across the plains. He made angry jabs with his blunt forefinger at the dial and to its faint responsive tinkling, an invisible curtain rose upon a series of events that were to be confined within the dark hours of that short summer night, bounded between dusk and dawn. So closely did these events follow the arbitrary design of a play that the temptation to represent Mr Glossop as an overture cannot be withstood. The hospital, now almost settling down for the night, had assumed an air of enclosed and hushed activity. Lights appeared behind open windows, and from the yard that ran between the hospital offices and the wards, one could see the figures of nurses on night duty moving quietly about their business. Mingled with the click of the telephone dial was the sound of distant, tranquil voices, and from the far end of the yard, the very occasional strains of music from a radio in the new army buildings. The window of the records office stood open. Through it, one looked across the yard towards two and three, now renamed Civilian Two and Civilian Three, since the military had taken over wards four to six and remade them as military wards. Each ward had a covered porch and a short veranda at the rear linking it to the next ward. Before each veranda stood a rich barrier of climbing roses. The brief New Zealand twilight was not quite at an end, but already the spendthrift fragrance of the roses approached its nightly zenith. The setting, in spite of itself, was romantic. Mr Glossop, however, was not conscious of romance. He was cross and anxious, and when he spoke into the telephone, his voice held overtones of resentment. I'll leave it there, but just to show you, there's a map of the hospital and the hospital grounds. Very nigh marsh to do a map. Hope you enjoy it and I'd love to hear what you thought. Bye bye. Can I just say that, do you not think that Stella Duffy should present Jack and Ori? Well, you know that's I'm... quite ironic because she read the audio book, so. Oh, wow. Well, the, do you know what? She's fantastic, isn't she? Yeah. I was just listening to thinking, <laughs> I want a hug from Stella Duffy. That was wonderful. Um, right. So, Hoot, I think, Jackie, it falls to you to get yeah. us started on this one. Yeah. Yeah. I got the tricky one. Um, first of all, yeah, I, I, I agree about the reading. I actually, I experienced it through the audio book. And, and I think that really, get, it was a different experience. I think the reading the book, to listen to Stella read the different voices, um, it was an absolute delight and to be transported. And I, and I think first and foremost, that is what I really enjoyed about this book, that reading it again now, um, during lockdown, to be taken away in time and space was brilliant. It was, it was really very good. Um, I also want to say, you know, Stella, to, to take on that challenge, I mean, you know, lesser mortals would have thought, I can't go there. I, you know, to, to approach, you know, one of the queens of golden age and say, I will take on and, and I will, you know, I will fashion this novel and finish it off. Kudos, because that is that is no mean feat. And I think then as readers, if anybody approaching the book is, is a, you know, is an avid Nio Marsh reader, you know, and, and has been there and has, I think that's going to be tricky because I think it's a little bit like a relationship, isn't it? When you've been so used to someone's embrace and, and, and someone's perfume and, and you, you're attuned to that and this might be different. And in the difference, there might be a, I'm not sure I can, I'm not sure I can do this. I'm not sure I can love you like I loved before. So I think if you come in this, you know, to this novel, totally fresh, having never been there, I think you're going to say, this is just amazing. Yeah. So, so I, I think it's a book of, of two viewpoints, maybe. And I know that's simplistic. Um, but New Zealand, during the Second World War, um, it, it felt as, listening. it felt like watching a black and white Second World War movie. Um, 
you could see, you know, the nurses, the soldiers, and those beautiful elements of golden age locked room, but slightly, slightly tongue in cheek in places. And then what I loved as well was the peppering of, of the Shakespeare lines throughout it. You know, I mean, it, it just, there was a warmth to that because there was a familiarity and I loved it. So I've been taken to New Zealand, you know, to the plains of Christchurch, Canterbury and, and you know, never been to South Island, don't know it. And again, in a different place and time. But this idea of who did it, you know, there's a death, there's murders maybe, um, there's money that's gone missing, who's responsible for that. There's emotional baggage of does, you know, can I approach somebody? Do they love me? Do they not? Should I be a better person? Um, the morality of that time captured beautifully. And yet it being worked now, it's like, mm, has Stella Duffy worked in some elements of really now would we you know would we look at things in that way I, I, so i felt that there was a constant tension of a book that was started back then and a book that was finished now and and we are not the people of them mm -hmm. we, we we can't view and we can't read and i wonder can we write as somebody that would have done back then all that said I just think it is it is a it is a beautiful, beautiful, I don't want to use the word romp because that feels so <laughs> wrong. But it was a it was a refreshing read. It was a refreshing read because, you know, so much darkness, doom, gloom. You know, I'm usually in Scandi Nordic, you know, serial killers, and this wasn't, and it was wonderful. And again, I think, you know, as a as a as a as somebody taking on a character, I really enjoyed, you know, the, seeing Inspector Allen in these circumstances, being undercover, being espionage, you know, and it worked for me. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed. So ringing endorsement there. So we have a familiar face in new perfume. Now, is that new perfume Chanel number no. five or high karate? Lee, what did you think? Well, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I've read it twice now, and I'm, I'm a fan of Stella's anyway. It's really funny to me that she showed the diagram because I have notes here about, so to me, charts in books are always a warning. So are cast lists. It's like, oh hell, there's gonna be a lot going on here and I'm gonna be flipping the whole damn time. And the thing, I, you can't, can you see behind me? I, I love golden age books. So you can see the green spines and the yellow spines. I love Golden Age mysteries, but one thing that happens all the time in Golden Age mysteries is what I call the whizzing effect. People go here, they go there, they go here, they go there, they go back and forth and back and forth. And you keep flipping back in the book to figure out where the hell they are in space and time. And it suddenly the penny has dropped for me. And I just wonder if it's not draining to me in the 21st century because I get to sit on my fat butt googling stuff or calling people up i don't have to go down the road to make sure mrs jones is all right and then come back and tell somebody she's all right and then go back and make sure mr jones is all right and then come back and i just wonder if that's not so in that sense stella's perfectly captured the golden age for me there is a lot of whizzing around oh endless whizzing around and endless characters who are you know, if you're the least bit distracted, you're like, which one was that again? Yeah, which soldier is this? Which yeah. nurse is this? Where did, yeah. There yeah. definitely are a couple of moments where I thought, I think this is Stella's 21st century sensibility, where she talks about indigenous people mm -hmm. versus the English, you know, coming in with their ideas and their values. Um, and there was, um, so I did think, okay, that's probably Stella rather than Ms. Marsh. Um, but another thing I really loved was the way that she highlighted the intense subtlety of what Alan has to do, the intense psychological strategizing he has to do at every moment to bring people to the point he wants to bring them to, to wait until they're ready to say a thing 
that he thinks he already knows what they're going to say. I thought that was really well realized. Yeah. Alex, would, uh, before that, Maria Flaherty says, I need this book now. So congratulations, ladies. You've, uh, you've made one sale <laughs> so far tonight, at least. Alex, what did you think? As I'm re rereading it today through audio, um, I, all I could think was is I'm glad I actually interviewed Stella so I understand what the background to it is. Um, and I could tell where the elements are coming from um, because without that, you'd be thinking um, Naya, Naya Marsh is something I'm not quite used to. But there were so many elements, gold mage elements, which were a nice little comfort blanket. Um, like you could always tell that it was a lot room thing. And the, the number of times, um, like Jackie said about the, uh, about the about the play references, I was thinking, are they laid in as clues? Because now, of course, Naya Marsh was a former playwright. So possibly. Um, but I don't know my Shakespeare and, you know, um, unable to find out enough about the plays to find out whether they are clues or not. So, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of uh, Midsummer Night's Dream in this. I mean, it's, yeah. it's allegorical of that. Um, um, Craig Sisterson, uh, a Kiwi in exile here, uh, has said, writes to say, it's an interesting point by Jackie and something I've mulled over before too. The difference between a modern author writing historical novels, for example, Abir's crap books set against the waning <laughs> Uh, and an author of the time like Christie and Marsh writing about those times while in those times. Um, I think I'm going to have to give you my two cents worth um, and I'm going to take a wee bit of a dissenting view on this one. Um, I think it's it's a huge accomplishment. I think Stella Duffy has taken on something as you both as you've all said um, and she accomplishes it so that you do not really know where one finishes or one starts. Um, like you all, I had this feeling that it was um, there. Were, there were points around the the um, the, Aborig uh, the the Maori people uh, that are brought into the book, um, and I wondered, well, was that in the original, or is this a character that Stella has brought mm -hmm. in? Um, having said all that, um, my view is that if we're we're talking about this sort of fiction from this sort of time, um, if we're going to be if we're going to be reading this, it has to tell us something new. It has to, it, and there was nothing in this for me that was different. There was nothing that I, I took away from this and felt, yes, I've learned something or yes, I've been challenged by something. It, for what it was, it was great. But, but for me, it, 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 was, it didn't do anything that Agatha Christie didn't do and didn't do, you know, in my opinion, with characters that I prefer. So I, I much prefer Poirot to Alain. Um, but that's just my choice. And I'm willing to forgive Christie certain things because I love Poirot in the way that I'm not willing to forgive Dame Niall Marsh because I'm not wedded to the character in the same way. So therefore I was coming at it from a point of view of I want mm. something new. Mm. I want something, and again, it's a very difficult situation because you know Stella Duffy's taking on, I think it was only several chapters. Um, sure. And she's written yeah. something which is, which is faithful to the time and the place, um, but in doing that I and, and you know I think for me it didn't hit the mark because there was nothing in it that spoke to me as a reader um, and I wanted to look and uh, Rona Will has written I wanted to love this book but I struggled with it I usually love golden age era novels yet it just did not hold me and I, I would I would probably echo that I mean I there were aspects of this book that I liked but there was nothing I mean the other two books gripped me this one didn't grip me in the same way Mm -hmm. whereas, whereas I think for me usually being in the previous two books that you know for me they were just like yeah and and, and this third book was I don't normally do this mm -hmm. and and so I think for me I, I, I got you know I was taken on you know as I said and, and viewing it from the point of view of Stella you brave woman absolutely brave woman you know to, to take this on because to produce something like this, you know, where, you know, would other people have managed to, yeah. to create a full story around something? Because what the danger is, you know, do you do something that is so not that, mm -hmm. that it's unrecognizable? 
And you, you can't, you can't, because it's got yeah. a following, hasn't mm -hmm. it? Um, yeah. You know, on that very point, I was asked by the estate of, of a deceased author to maybe look at writing something that had been started by this author. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had to say no, because it, it, I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't feel comfortable, re, re, uh, you know, recreating that style mm -hmm. um, and being faithful to that author whilst telling the stories that I felt I wanted to tell. So it, the point you make, Jackie, is is extremely valid. It's, it's, it's very difficult. And I didn't feel up to the challenge. Um, but still, it does this, and she does it remarkably well um so let's yeah. let's um let's put it to a vote then what do we think one well, thumb two thumbs no thumbs two four I'm not, yeah i'm not quite sure really yeah okay two. so anyway still you know what i think what we've proved is that it's horses for courses we all knew this but we've all liked different things in three very different books yeah um yeah. which is which is which is wonderful mm -hmm. um and it just goes to show you that, you know, and, and that's the joy of crime fiction. It's such a broad church. Um, and we all love it because of that. Um, before we finish, uh, let's look forward to next month's Bloody Scotland Book Club, introduced by Craig Robertson. Um, Craig is here just to tell us a wee bit about it. Hello. I think we've got three very interesting books for you for July. I am going to be joined by reviewer and blogger, Lindsay Adams festival organiser and crime fiction fan Anna Day, and New Zealand-born writer and reviewer Craig Sisterson. We, along with you, are going to read these three books. Black Top Wasteland by S.A. Cosby, Our Little Cruelties by Liz Nugent, and The Quaker by Leo McIlvany. Please read one, two, or all three of these books Come back at the end of July and we can talk about it then. There you are. That sounds fantastic. And some of you might have thought that um, Craig's lips were, were out of sync there. It's not true. He's actually French. Uh, and that was dubbed <laughs> into Scottish. Um, all that remains tonight is for me to thank my wonderful panellists, Lee, Jackie and Alex. Thank you so much uh, for taking part and making this so much fun. And thank you all at home uh, who've been watching and submitting your wonderful questions. Um, the discussion wouldn't, wouldn't have been half as enlightening without you. Um, please do tune in for the next episode where Monsieur Craig Robertson will be taking you through the next lot of books. And in the meantime, please stay safe and happy reading. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye.